actually live, guys. Welcome, everyone. Okay. Um, my name is Abud, and today we are joined by um, a very, very special guest. Uh, Jared's also joined us, but our special guest is yeah. Michael Baron, and he's a very, very special friend of mine. He, I can also say he is my uh, teacher, and I've also taught him a lot from the Samaritan community, from the Samaritan culture. Um, he, I really love sitting and talking with uh, Mr. Michael, and he's very knowledgeable about the Torah and also about science, my, like one of my favorite two topics. And he kind of blends in those two topics extremely well. And, um, and you also do um, workshops, I believe, about that, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's all about the the bridge between uh, Torah and science. Uh, too many times, um, you know, I, I I look at it as spin. You know, you have very narrow minded, uh, you know, uh, religious minds uh, on on one extreme, and you have you know your atheists on another extreme. And to my humble understanding, here talking about you know two sides of one uh, coin really two um, ways of approaching truth that um, just happen to complement one another very, very much and have many more matching points than people might imagine. Um, commonly, you know, you know, misunderstandings occur when people have an imperfect understanding of one of those disciplines. Right. So that's really beautiful. Well, we do see like uh, like the youth or at least like the, the newer generation uh, because of like the internet and because they are more open to the world, they can have like some like for example knowledge about science that they will interpret as against Torah, right? Exactly. And right. How how do you work with, like with like how do you think like, how did you start this whole idea of connecting science to Torah? When did you sure? Start? Well, for many years I functioned as a, as a rabbi, and I actually have uh, published a, a few books in my time. And essentially, my uh, vein is out, outreach. And um, again, it was very much of, a, of an outreach uh, rabbi, but um, on an academic level. Basically, I'm, I don't know if you've heard of uh, rabbis such as Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi, or Rabbi Amnon Yitzchak, and you know preachers like that. So that kind of Preaching never ever spoke to us, and basically, what uh, you know, I was always pushing for many years was the uh, the tradition of the of Maimonides, Rabbi Saadia Gaon, mm -hmm. the Ibn Ezra, the ancient rationalist uh, approach to Torah. Mm -hmm. So it isn't something that's like um, you would imagine, maybe the advent of the Enlightenment era, 19th century, you know, 20th century. But it's actually something that goes back very, very deeply. And, um, and basically, at a certain point in time, uh, I realized that I have a lot more to give uh, by sort of taking a, a, a few steps back from rabbinics and really just uh, putting my efforts into, into research. I connected with a world-class Egyptologist, uh, David Roll, and um, and who basically helped me discover uh, this this talent, which I never even knew that I had really, which is uh, for epigraphy. You know, basically uh, you know, reading years ago, old language, yeah, an ancient language. Be Beautiful. Basically, you know, when I went into you know formal Torah studies, you know, a couple of two and a half decades ago, uh, I already went in being able to read. Uh, as you know, because of our time together, uh, Paleo Hebrew. Yeah, you read uh, very good. Thank you. And uh, that, of course, was what enabled me to, to learn to read Samaritan script very quickly. So, um, but what I had no idea about is that basically because of my fluency in the Hebrew Bible and my ability to read Paleo Hebrew and my ex experience studying archaeology at the Hebrew U, um, that I would be able to um, be, give, uh, give a, a great contribution to the field of the earliest, earliest Hebrew script at, uh, called proto sinaitic Okay. That's basically the very, very, very beginnings of the Hebrew script. That, and what does that mean? A proto means before, but what's the... Yeah, it's yeah, a proto proto -like. name. Yeah, Jared, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, I wanted to explain it because I hadn't talked so far. <laughs> 
Go ahead. Is, yeah. What do you know about it, Jerry? I was just going to say the word proto just means like the earliest form of Early, something. Early, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, I, that's just a fancy word essentially for the very, very first alphabet. And it really is the ancestor of all the phonetic alphabets. And it happens to be Hebrew. And essentially, you know, there are these inscriptions in the Sinai Desert and in Egypt that, you know, over the last century, uh, researchers were essentially really overshooting and sort of uh, underestimating just how purely these inscriptions can be read as early Hebrew. Mm -hmm. So once, you know, I teamed up with David Rule and he started saying, what can you read in these inscriptions? Um, of course, once you enter that world, you just have to become so much more open-minded. You no longer have the liberty of being, you know, um, very, very closed polemically, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, on one hand, of course, I, I found so much to like support the core narrative of the Torah. It's just incredible. We think that we find found inscriptions from the time of the Exodus. And, um, and again, I have an academic supervisor so much. It's not like me, you know, tooting my own horn. Um, but on the other hand, you just see that the reality on the ground was something that was just, you know, you have to just, it forces you to blow up in your mind. Right. And I think one of my favorite, um, you know, things that I, uh, like one of my favorite documentaries, you were in it, one of, one of them was the Exodus uh, in, uh, Decoded, is or not the Exodus Decoded, uh, one of one of the, the Moses controversy. All right, 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 right. That one. I've seen you had parts in it. Um, can you tell me exactly? Can you tell the audience exactly what what like did you appear to talk about? Sure. So there's this. Uh, uh, he happens to be an evangelical Christian, but you know he gave a lot of respect uh, to uh, to my scholarship, not to me personally. Um, they just basically gave me this sort of one minute camel. But, but essentially, when David Roll is presenting these inscriptions, you know, as uh, perhaps being inscriptions from Moses himself, that's my work. <laughs> In the movie itself, they ended up cutting a lot out, which was very unfortunate. And in the next installment, uh, there will be more. But essentially, there's, more, there's a new part. Yeah, there are different, uh, you know, segments. And what it is, is they actually did a, quite a good job in their first movie and in this second one a little bit less so but still good but it's basically taking on the biblical minimalists okay. people essentially were saying that there's no real truth behind these narratives it's just ancient you know fantasies um so but and basically looking at you know new discoveries over the last couple of few decades and seeing the incredible evidence that is surfacing i was wondering about something so when it comes to the uh, evidence for the exodus um i ha i think it was in the documentary called exodus decoded um they found what they uh, assumed to be the i think J it, it a coin that had jacob's name on it did you hear about it yeah yakub har yeah yakub har do you think this might be something connected to the real joseph did you so um that was the work of uh, Simcha Yakubovici. Was who, found in Egypt around like... So, yeah, what it is is, you know, he's a person that, you know, he's a, he's a movie director. And, you know, you have to have a, a respect for any scholar. So I don't mean to speak disparagingly, but essentially that kind of work of, oh, we found this and, oh, we found that. And we can sort of connect the dots and it looks like, you know, this is evidence. It's, it's very amateur as opposed to like, a very, very robust chronology-based uh, approach to where the Exodus was um, based on like archaeoastronomy. You know, I mean, today the um, the tools that professionals like world-class chronologists use are out of this world. And so, you know, Yakub Har, you know, finding one particular uh, you know mention of a particular Yakub. You know, th think about just in the Samaritan community and in the Jewish community. Okay, mm -hmm. how many people are named Yaakov? <laughs> we have a lot. My uncle's name's Yaakov. <laughs> exactly. So just like finding one particular uh, uh, 
you know, one particular inscription that says Yaqub. Doesn't mean, that's yeah, not, that's that's fair. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Basically, the guiding... Uh, I mean, what are the chances? <laughs> right. The yeah. guiding, uh, like, you know, wisdom that you can apply to this, you can apply to the subjects that, you know, you guys discuss in this podcast and just anything is that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Yeah. Right. So like the more but also remembering that lack of evidence is not evidence of lack. Right. So you can have both. <laughs> evidence of lack. Yeah, I like it. to put that way. Yeah. So really um like So if I could just ask one question, uh real quick. So about the story of Exodus, do you think there's any sort of historiosity to it? Like is any of it true or like how much of it do you think is inspired by events or if it is a true event? I think it's completely inspired. Um, when you read an ancient text, of course, you need to understand the way that the ancients would tell over a narrative. In other words, you have to enter that mindset and you have to, to make room for the use of metaphor, the use of exaggeration, the use of special numbers, which okay. would have communicated and meant something within that culture so un unfortunately you know and uh, this has been a problem not just for minimalists but also for um uh, very you know religious very narrow religious minds and that is that we're we are all commonly reading the text like greeks in a very literal sense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's just not the way that ancients wrote right this is way before you know, the, uh, the the era of the Greeks. So literalism just wasn't the thing. Can you give us one example? Um, sure. So, for example, in the flood, when it talks about, you know, um, uh, you know un underneath the whole, all of the heavens, okay, or, you know, even the highest of mountains, okay, were covered over. So that is a perfect example of exaggeration. And, mm -hmm. uh, you, and there are clear examples in uh, the wider Tanakh uh, of, of this. And, uh, or for example, you know, the use of mountains there. Hold on a minute. Maybe you should at least, if you don't have the education, this is not you guys, I'm just saying, you yeah. know, people out there, um, you know, maybe you should speak to a Sumerologist, okay? You know, a scholar of that particular culture and see what were mountains in those days. So you'll see that there that that whole plain is an area, you know, flatter as flat as Kansas, so to speak. In other words, this flat, 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 flat plain that you can't even see the mountains from one end to the other. Wow. And this is a time, if you can imagine, even before people rode animals. They didn't even ride donkeys, if you can imagine. Like this is such an early time in history. So you would live your entire life um, just knowing from one horizon to the other. And your whole life you might move about, you know, some 30 uh, miles or so. Very, very, very vast world compared to what it even was in the times of the Exodus, right? which was even larger and less connected than it was maybe, you know, 2000 years ago. Okay. So it turns out that mountains in those days were referring to their temples. Mm -hmm. And um, so if you see where the actual evidence, overwhelming evidence of the Mabul, you know, the actual flood of Noah, where we actually find it, that's not something you can hide. You know, this massive floodplain, many meters deep, all there got to be bones. some undeniable evidence, right? Right. Yeah. But you're not going to find it, you know, in Australia. In Australia, you're not going to find it in uh, Armenia. Yeah. So, th yeah. That's it. so there's all, once you account for the use of metaphor, exaggeration, put yourself in the eyes of the, of, of the people that that text was intended for, then you set yourself up for finding real evidence. And what, once you have the right place in history, Jared, um, it's, it's amazing. Basically, there are three main opinions as to when the exodus occurred by those people who believe that it, that it happened. There's an early date, a middle date, 
and a latter date. And each one of them has a set of evidence that people put together to go, wow, there's a pharaoh like this, and there's a fig maybe a Moses figure like that. Um, but where you really see everything coming together in the most extraordinary way would be what we what is called out there the early period, which would be the late 13th dynasty, the end basically of the, the fall of Egypt, the fall of the Middle Kingdom, and the beginning of the second intermediary period when the Hyksos come in. That's where, um, that is the date actually, um, that according to Torah chronology, the best, the most reliable Torah, you know, internal Torah chronology, which is yielded by those verses that talk about, you know, and so and so lived so many years and then he begat a son. So those verses yield a particular chronology. And uh, when you use the most reliable nusa, which them. means, you know, uh, a form of the Torah, um, you'll see that 1446, 1447, that would be the date of the Exodus. And that's mm. exactly where we find the fall of this pharaoh named Dudemos, probably Dudemos II. And what's right. crazy is that in, in, a, in a slightly later period, okay, this is the, 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 the Hellenistic period. This is the time of uh, the, when Greece, uh, when, a, Grec, when a, uh, a Greek ruler, the, uh, the, the Ptolemies ruled Egypt. Mm. So there were very good historians, you know, Egyptian historians of that time. Can you imagine what an incredible thing to learn about Egyptian history of what was from a perspective of 2,200 years ago. That's incredible, yeah. And, but, and by, so they say that this, the pharaoh of this exodus when you know the Israelites left uh, was Tutimaus, Tutimaus. And uh, Tutimaus really fits in perfectly as Dudimaus. Okay. The and that's where we actually find hard evidence of, of the plagues. And um, so on academia.edu, I don't know if you're familiar with that platform, academia.edu, okay. uh, in, in Feb, I just published a 95-page paper summing up um, you know, all of my work until this point um, with the inscriptions that we've uh, been able to read, decode, and uh, interpret, and how the whole picture comes together. That's really interesting. Yeah. Speaking about the whole picture coming together, um, I have an important question for you that I will, well, I really uh, was curious for a lot of time, for a long time now. Um, I get, I, I don't often get asked this question, but I did a few times, um, but I want to hear your opinion. So there are people who do not believe in the Exodus, right? Uh, obviously and there's and when they come to that argument they would ask you well where did the hebrews really come from like where did the jews come from where did the samaritans really come from if they didn't come from an exodus from egypt where were they before that so, Hebrews. yeah well i'll tell you first of all a uh, fewer and fewer academics deny an exodus that's very important when it, but we, a lot of times we're very much in this kind of a hang up that it's um, the people who believe in the Bible, believe in the Torah, vis-a-vis -vis the academics. And um, that's we're really no longer in that, that same kind of a, of a, of a world. Um, things are now in a, uh, in this, in, at, the, at a place where you have heads of departments uh, in archaeology, um, Egyptology, people who believe that there is a historical basis to these things. However, the real hard nut to crack is actually here in Israel. And uh, the darling of the archaeological community here is Dr. Israel Finkelstein of Tel Aviv University. And uh, again, he's a, he's a professional and he's arguably the best excavator, okay, in Israel. In other words, a person who actually knows, is a professional in excavating. Um, it's just that the way that he puts the pieces together, um, we think is problematic. And uh, you can understand it because, you know, if they're wrong, you know, it's a lot for them 
you know, as, as, a, as a broad institution to lose. But this is what they say, that there's no real evidence of this grand exodus um, that, and um, it, it, it makes, makes a lot more sense to them is that the Canaanites of the land basically amalgamated and assumed some sort of an ethos maybe for peace and you know when you're trying to make you know peace among different tribes it works really well if you discover or come to an understanding that in fact you were all brothers you know the son of one patriarch but essentially um you know we we're just these uh, uh overblown celebrated canaanites <laughs> that came together and maybe there were some people who came from egypt but and Nothing. then they decided to make this Israelite religion, or what? Like, and yeah. So, uh, the kingdom of Israel, Israel, that was really, you know, the main deal. And there's no doubt that, you know, even archaeologically speaking, and you know, see that, you know, you just have the Bible itself makes it overwhelming and clear that the original center was Shechem. And uh, Judah was very much was a smaller, uh, less powerful militarily more like a vassal state to the much more powerful northern kingdom and the southern kingdom was from the tribe of judah benjamin and like right half of levi yes yeah, yeah exactly and uh when assyria came in and destroyed the northern kingdom leaving most of the actual people of the northern kingdom here that's uh quite well understood in fact that only a minority were actually taken away into exile, which really supports, of course, the Samaritan. Right, they tradition. do say twenty-seven thousand, but yeah. So um, well, essentially, man. you know, that's how things got going, and the rest of it, you know, the Bible is uh, is they they would say is is pretty reliable. But uh, the reason why why would they be driven to that conclusion? The main thing is where we find the evidence of the fall of Jericho and key cities, Canaanite cities. Well, it's found in the, 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 the last part of the Middle Bronze Age. In the last part of the Middle Bronze Age, that is where you find this dramatic fall of Jericho. Uh, it appears it, it, to, to look like it was fallen by a massive earthquake you know, an, an act of God, an act of Hashem, uh, you could say, you know, and you find the fall of certain Canaanite cities. The problem is, is that a, a, uh, according to the Egyptian timeline of, you know, of Egyptian history of the different dynasties and when pharaohs actually reigned, that would be way too early for the time of the Exodus. Okay. So Timing if the Exodus, off. yeah. So if the Exodus occurred, let's say at the time that um, is in the Masoretic text, you know that chronology, or even Septuagint, even Samaritan, you're you're basically having the Israelites, you know, come out of Egypt, and they would have been walking by the ruins of Jericho in these cities that would have fallen a long time before. So time would be like not falling right. to the right place. Exactly. So en enter new chronology and revised chronology. So basically you have a whole generation now of serious academics who are challenging mainstream chronology and bringing overwhelming, very, very like physics-based uh, proof uh, that basically, if you can just imagine the, the the timeline. Remember, we talked about Hellenistic era Egypt. Yes. Yeah. So just imagine if right before then, the end of dynastic Egypt, the the, the, the you know the history of the pharaohs. We're talking twenty first, twenty second uh, dynasties. Imagine if at that late time, basically the end of the pharaonic era. Imagine. If two of some of those last dynasties were not one after the other, mm -hmm. but actually reigning at the same time, imagine the 21st and the 22nd dynasty, that these were actually two lines of pharaohs who were 
actually ruling at the same time. And there's a, like overwhelming evidence, like different lines of evidence that that is in th the truth. The moment that you, you make that fix, all of those earlier dynasties, you know, all those earlier reigns of those pharaohs get, you know, pulled forward by at least 150 years, 160 mm. years. And when that happens, like basically the fall of the Middle Kingdom, this dramatic descent into chaos of Egypt occurs precisely in line with the Exodus. You know, 40 years later is a perfect time for Jericho to fall, according to, you know, the, uh, the, the majority opinion of the experts of when Jericho actually fell. Mm -hmm. And boom, 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 everything falls into place. Go back 215 years earlier, you get to the time of the vizier Anhu, who we believe to be Joseph, Tzafanat Pa'anch. Ah, in ancient Pa'anch. Hebrew, we, see, we say Sefin Tifan. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and we have a, a Joseph like character. You can actually see incredible evidence for the famine, the, you know, the, the years of of uh plenty followed by the years of famine mm -hmm. uh and we, you know you can actually identify uh um, we believe manasseh and ephraim okay the two tribes of joseph right and it's i mean everything comes together you have a good candidate for you know the pharaoh who knew not joseph who enslaved the hebrews and basically the whole picture comes together Okay, uh, if I could interject for a second, because I, I just got to ask, how much of this is peer-reviewed and how much of it is, is accepted by the wider academic community? So, um, a lot. Um, essentially, if you read my paper, um, you can actually, actually, not, to tell you the truth, that was one thing that we took out just because of the length, but I could actually send you personally a whole list of um of you know, people on the doctoral level uh, you know who subscribe to uh one of the different variants of new chronology revised chronology basically revising the egyptian timeline according to this the, there is a very uh a best-selling book called centuries of darkness Anyway, okay. Google it, Centuries of Darkness. And basically what you have is like these, you know, five, you know, top category, uh, uh, like Oxford Countries, uh, scholars, scholars, basically creating what is essentially like a coup d'etat, like a revolution from within, within the archaeological vanguard. Like slavery, for example, revol right. revolving, revolving. Making this exact point. And um, so David Rule, for example, a lot of people like to just attack him and make it look like it's David Rule against the world, but that is just really <laughs> not the reality. My academic supervisor, Jared, is uh, Dr. Peter Vanderveen, who is from, uh, a, he's a, a professor at the University of Mainz, Germany, which is considered to be the most um, um, I can say the most serious institution in Europe when it comes to the studies of West Semitic, which basically means ancient Hebrew. And he is a revised chronologist. In other words, this that these dates of the time of the Exodus and Joseph, this is well agreed between he, his colleagues, and David Rule. Okay. Because essentially, you know, um, you know, when you look at the evidence not just the evidence it's the quality of evidence and and you do so without bias and that's the hardest thing because you know these professors they've built a whole you know career you know on their reputation and, and they're going to fight tooth and nail okay well i mean of course people get personal stakes into things but i mean because like what i'm what i'm hearing here is it's been a while since i looked into the history that's this old so because like the story or like the history so far as like I've heard it growing up was there was like Natufian culture, 
which then later got subsumed into the larger Semitic type culture, which later morphed into the Canaanites and the Canaanites started to diverge. And then in the North, you had the Phoenicians and the South, you had the Canaanites and the Canaanites just sort of emerged into the Hebrews and the Hebrews were just essentially connected to everything around the region and had the whole story of the Torah essentially inspired by events that happened around them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and mm-hmm. yeah, I'm so just okay. saying like that's history I heard. And I don't know, like if, the community, the larger academic community accepts evidence, then like I will revise my opinion with based with new facts. But mm-hmm. uh, this isn't because like I'm I'm essentially I'm a layman. You know, I'll I'll leave, I'll leave it to the experts, but I prefer to listen to like the majority opinion. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Uh, today, unfortunately, um, in the soft sciences, okay, like you know, anthropology, archaeology. It's a different animal than, let's say, the world of physics and the world of math. Yeah. And um, a lot of these things are very much subject you know, to interpretation. And unfortunately, over the last 150 years, there's basically become a very, very, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, stubborn orthodoxy. And mm. um, we're talking about a discipline that you would assume you know, would listen to the better angels of, of our nature mm-hmm. and, you know, be willing to just, you know, change their views according to the new evidence. But that's just not the reality. You know, stubborn orthodoxies are not just an issue for religions. They're also an, an issue in science, unfortunately, which in sometimes in some ways has become um, sort of like a religion of the time. Yeah, because so, the problem with science, with scientific evidence, is that you can sometimes you can cherry pick, and you can cherry pick evidence, and you and it's kind of becomes relatively easy to build a theory based on the cherry picked evidence and overlook the facts that might go against your theory. Mm-hmm. So I, I, mean, I mean, that's why peer reviewing is so important in modern yeah, science and academia sure. because humans yeah. are fallible. Absolutely, and all of this work is peer reviewed. Okay. So uh, that's that's for sure. And remember, all these different sides in these debates, there's no one here who is, you know, caricaturing anyone as the village idiot, as opposed to, you know, the messianic genius. <laughs> there's no one here. Everyone builds on one another. You can have one particular um, general opponent in a particular field that may have an incredibly sagacious insight on something. So we all build on one another. We all help one another. It's, you know, that's what it's all about, Beautiful. ultimately. Beautiful. Um, there's so, uh, one thing I wanted, wanted you to share also with the audience um, that I think they might be interested in because we have a, I have a lot of people that, that ask me about Samaritans and Samaritan culture all the time. Um, but you got involved in the Samaritan uh, studies, uh, I think, uh, what, five years ago or something like that? Can you tell us at least like in a brief uh, a way of like how did you discover this community and how does it, is it a kind of like an integration to the Jewish people? Like can it be like some kind of a, how, sure. what's the most important link with the Jewish people? Uh, the Absolutely. Samaritans? It's very simple. Um, for me, you know, I grew up. No, uh, non-religious per se. We had a very strong, you know, Jewish identity. We had um, also a strong Israeli uh, identity. I go back here in the land for a number of generations, uh, even before my parents. So, you know, I actually grew up in an expat Israeli uh, community in California, if you can imagine. So we had a strong in identity. California. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> South Bay, Silicon Valley, you know. Um, um, but when I became, a, a, you know, tour observant, I didn't do so from like a place of ignorance. I was already, you know, a college graduate or actually now I was in my latter years of university. So for me, it was all about, you know, the truth about these things. And um as you know, very naturally, because I have a kind of a scientific mindset, when I, uh, after doing my rabbinical studies and you know coming into into teaching Torah, I said, you know what, why not just bring where it is that I came from, to the service of, of the cause, 
And I wrote a book called Oral Torah from Sinai. It's on Amazon.com. Okay. And, and essentially bringing the really strong bits of evidence that there's a lot of oral tradition that the Jewish people maintained that actually is far older than 2000 years ago. Okay. Uh, you know, 2000 years old. And, um, but essentially as being this, um, this, this uh, scholar, that people from all over the world were asking me questions and what do you say about this? And how would you answer that? I, um, I really took it upon myself to develop an archive of evidence of being able to answer any question that came my way. So one time somebody asked me the Samaritan question, what about the Samaritan Pentateuch? So here we have an ancient people, you know, have this Torah tradition. You know, what, what, what about these people? Um, so I found online a uh, colleague of mine in New York, uh, Rabbi Gill student. Okay, he had you know the best argument about uh, the the uh, the Samaritans. Uh, you know, I would say that the you know according to what I knew, the sort of the classic rabbinical response, essentially that it's too perfect. It's clearly been been worked on. So you know I I. Just kind so of perfect shot that meaning off. like um, like it's written to support the Samaritan beliefs like or like that 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 too and also that uh, just the uh, the flow of the narrative the, the the flow of the plot you know hangs together sort of you know too nicely and it's it's you know if you want to find something that's very ancient you should find something that's a little bit you know choppy with the wording that's kind of less perfect or whatever and um, okay. Uh, for example, there's defective spelling as, you know, where, you know, remember the original Hebrew, when the Torah was originally written down, okay, there were no letter vowels. So, so there was no Yud for E, there was no uh, Vav, Wo for O. You would say those when you would read it, just like a person who reads Samaritan Hebrew very nicely can read it without the vowels. And just like uh, the Jewish people, according to all their different um, uh, traditions, read the Torah without vowels. That's how it was originally without letter vowels. So the, so the claim is, is that because there are more of these letter vowels in the Samaritan, it's more worked on. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is before I knew anything about the text. Later on, when I started doing these textual studies, you know, from tabula rasa, from a blank slate, what I find is that you have an overwhelming number of exactly the opposite of places where you have the added voweling in the Masoretic and you actually have defective spelling, defective, not, you know, that's the, 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 the term in the Samaritan. But essentially, then I came across something that changed my scholarship forever and just really changed the whole way that I look at the Torah <laughs> irreversibly. And uh, it was an article by Dr. Jonathan Bendov of Haifa University, um, who basically uh, gave a, a number of pieces of very, very compelling evidence that there were two um, clear, I don't know if you would call them censorships, changes, Losses of tradition, mm -hmm. whatever it might be, but Revisions. definitely two, yeah, that basically entered the Masoretic um, as, as opposed to the Samaritan, which is clearly the older tradition. And then I found, you know, through academia.edu, like a whole uh, stream of mainstream scholarship who are basically looking at certain key Samaritan variants, as, as they are called, as actually being originally uh, proto-Masoretic. In other words, and so, in other words, even if it's true that maybe certain elements, the Samaritan Pentateuch, you know, by and large, may have been added or changed somewhat, what's very, very clear is that, um, you know, these ancient traditions, okay, were, you know, developed over time in different, uh, um, in, the, in different communities in the ancient world. I mean, even but, language evolved, so I 
Yeah. So. But basically, the entire Samaritan narrative hinges around two very, very specific differences between a Samaritan Pentateuch and a Masoretic Pentateuch. So, you know, even let's say the Masoretic wins against all of the other, you know, variants. The very fact that you, you know, it seems very, very clear that those two variants are original. And it's, it's quite that the evidence for that is just is overwhelming. That right. just, that changes everything. And, and can then, you give an example? After you finish your point, also just by maybe like physical uh, findings of Samaritan Torahs, like what oldest book or uh, scroll did got found right. that we don't have? Sure. So it's written in Jewish scriptures, Yahalalucha Velopicha, which means you know, may you be praised, but not by your own mouth. So a lot of times, you know, the best evidence is what you would call from the horse's mouth, and you can basically find in a uh, very very ancient. Jewish sources back in Second Temple era, it's very, very clear that the original understanding of the place that the Lord your God shall choose was not the meaning of that wording in Hebrew, but rather the place that the Lord your God chose, past tense. All right, that's, that's the difference. A, that, that that's not a Samaritan that. thing. That's an ancient Judean thing. And you can actually see Second Temple, um, and in fact, back in Nehemia, in, in, in the book of Nehemia, it's very clear that he's, you know, quoting the Torah, and he's thinking about Jerusalem. But it's very clear that he's using that wording. But you have, for example, um, a Dead Sea Scroll fragment, and even beyond that, because the, uh, there are some people who want to say that maybe that's a possibility that's a fake. But you find very, very ancient translations. One of them, this is crazy, you got to put your seatbelt on for this. This is a Judean um, translation into earliest, into early Greek. Okay? That is 100 years older than the Septuagint. And the Can Septuagint is how old? Uh, 2000? It goes back to 250 BCE. That's 2000. 250 uh, years ago. And that's the wow. two judges when all the, the rabbis of the Sanhedrin came together uh, at the behest of Ptolemy and created this uh, translation of the Torah into Greek. And it's not just a translation, we actually find Torah scrolls according to that Nosach in Qumran. But there's an actual source that's 100 years older than that, and it's Judean. And we find the place that the Lord your God chose. Oh, that was and the Dead Sea Scroll, wasn't it? Well, that's no, that's that, that's, that's a second witness. Okay. That's a second witness. And, it, and instead of, and you shall build the altar on Mount Ebal, it says you shall build the, uh, the altar on Garizim. You know, Grizim. It's the, very, next, you know, the mountain next to Garzin, Garzin, I think, I think it says. With a new. So like, Yes. But again, you know, it was very inflected with Aramaic. So, you know, you have the endings in Nun instead of Mem. But um, it, so once you start, you know, doing this kind of research, it's not, you know, you, I came in, in a sense, as a rabbi, okay, tr um, not trying to conquer, so to speak, but, you know, trying to uh, really show the, the, um, uh, the answers to some of these deeper things, and, and of course, on certain points, and in certain, you know, smaller and sometimes larger, you get conquered. <laughs> yeah. hey, if uh, if I could, if I could ask a question about something about the United Kingdom specifically, real quick, because I just thought of this. Because um, from all right, so again, like layman, I'm just going off of what I've heard. Might not be the most up to date stuff. From what I know is that the United Kingdom, as in like there was a single kingdom, Israel and Judah united, didn't really happen, not in our common way that we think about it. It was more of once the northern kingdom of Israel was conquered, a large refugee population came from the north to Judea. Mm -hmm. And that gave rise to the story of the United Kingdom because it kind of was, if you think about it in a very poetic, metaphorical kind of way, 
people of the north coming to the south after they were conquered and mm -hmm. integrating into the wider uh, Judean Judean tradition. Yeah. So the 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 pattern. Just understand something. It, coming from an anthropology background, even before I became Torah observant. Okay. One of the things that uh, people were starting, so scholars were really becoming interested in, in like the 90s, back when I was in university, was, you know, many times the anthropologist is looking at the, the natives and trying to, you know, look at the natives. And, and too few times does the anthropologist turn a camera back on himself and look at the very culture of anthropology. And without realizing it, it, you know, and this is not, not being critical towards you at all. You're a beautiful person, but just mm -hmm. it's such a common thing. And it's only natural because we're just products of the cu cultures that we're brought up in. But the, the, the way that you just, you know, described and, oh, this is something that they came to think about themselves because of this. It's a very 19th century and early 20th century way of approaching the ancient world. And this is what anthropologists would do. They would go to Native American tribes who would talk about some flood maybe that occurred there, you know, so many centuries ago, you know, like in, uh, in, in the San Diego area, one of the peoples that I studied was a people, sorry that I'm going far afield, I'm gonna come back <laughs> to this fun. tangent. Um, but they were saying, no, you know, our in the days of our great grandfathers, great grandfathers, great grandfathers, you know, turns out to be about 500 years or so ago, there was a great flood. So anthropologists of, you know, a century ago would go into goes and go, oh, clearly this is the influence of, you know, Christian missionaries who had been here and, you know, had been talking about the biblical story of the flood and they're kind of appropriating that for themselves and then syncretism, in a word, a cynical, a very um, a p p a pedantic look on native cultures. And what they ended up finding in general, uh, just you know, over the span of the 20th century, particularly the latter half of the 20th century, is that just time after time after time, native cultures who had a, a, a cultural memory this is what had happened, and this is my this is our dynastic line, and this is where we come from. Those stories are now respected a lot more. In other words, they're considered to have a lot more um, historical weight to them than once before. So, now what you're saying, for example, oh, maybe this idea of a united monarchy was something that. Um, you know, maybe was imposed according, but the, the, we have actual um, inscriptions that go back to the house of David. And through the, um, through the eyes of new chronology, once you entertain the profound notion that the El Amarna period, I'm sure that whatever little Egyptology maybe uh, anybody remembers from you know, their school days, I'm sure yeah. everyone has heard of a pharaoh called Achenaten. And he really- uh, started... He's my favorite. Yeah. Yeah, he... yeah he's no, my favorite. But... I mean, his his god was a little sun disc with little cute hands on it. How could you not love him? I mean, he was a crazy Kim Jong-un-like figure, but you know. Well, you know, so, um, you know, it, it, that, it, see, that is what, you know, p people, at least they, they can, have some association with a pharaoh. But essentially, Achenaten was a worshiper of one god. He was a monotheist. And a lot of people want to say that he worshiped the sun. And by the way, that symbol that you're uh, yeah, describing the, the, uh, was, was actually a, uh, a symbol that was all across the region, even in Mesopotamia. And it represented the sun, with the sun deity or whatever. But in fact, David Rold understands that Atenism wasn't about worshiping the sun, but worshiping an invisible creator, okay, a one God, very much like the Hebrew God, who could be represented as, or it was manifest in the light of the sun, the rays of the sun. 
What's fascinating is that um, there's a lot of evidence that clades together that ties Achenaten to, to the time of King Saul, Shaul, and David. Essentially, when he, um, you know, here we have this king who is no longer strong on foreign policy. He's no longer, uh, you know, uh, 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 exercising uh, 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 power over his puppets in the Levant, in 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 his in uh, the land of Canaan. So you had the Philistine Seranim, right, who were essentially, you know, were these chiefs who were puppets of Egypt. The moment that Achenaten just doesn't look at, you know, the his puppets, you know, the 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 uh, Philistines. you know foreign policy, and just looks inwards, and is very very weak on foreign policy. This seems to be what gave the Bnei Israel, the Israelites, the chance to form, uh, you know, the monarchy and to consolidate, uh, you know, the very first uh, Israelite state. And so there's a lot that ties Saul, Shaul, with Labayu. And, and if this is true, you have a number of different names there. You know, from the book of Samuel, the book of Shamuel, the book of Shmuel, that appear in the El Amarna tablets, including David as, as, uh, as Tudia. Amazing. So, so, in other words, you know, you're kind of thinking is a completely understandable one, but it's coming from, I would say, a very cynical approach to these things. Yeah. And that, by the way, was born out of the heavy hand of the church on uh, the, the institution of science in Europe. So in all these different mm -hmm. fields, you have a very strong pushback you know, from the academic world of just wanting to put down anything that would, you know, suggest that, you know, the Judeo-Christian uh, uh, narrative ha has a core of, tr has a strong basis of truth. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't, I'm not saying that, like, there isn't any level of truth to it. I'm just saying, like, what I know from academia or at least what I've heard, I'd, again, it's been very, it's been a very long time since I've actually looked into any of it. I have too much stuff to do in my regular hours. It's just that uh, a lot of evidence suggests that these stories are based on real events, but were exaggerated. That was as far as my education grew up. And you should see my, what Jordan Peterson too. says about it, though, Jared. Exactly, like Jordan Peterson kind of uh, talked about taking the Torah literally. Uh, he has a really interesting perspective on the Torah. Yeah, I mean, he's he's an he's an interesting guy, but I'm not so sure I would. I don't know. For him, for me, he's a very flawed figure. He makes good points. I give him that. But when his entire career is based off of, like, I have to be right all the time, or this whole thing collapses around me, that's when I start to like. That's when I start to like distrust uh, some of the information I'm getting from somebody. Well, I can see what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, um, what it's all about ultimately, in my humble understanding, is uh, not being simplistic. Like, you know, everyone you know, usually has a very, very strong uh, place, you know, of expertise, any particular scholar. And he, just because a person might be uh, wrong on something doesn't mean that he doesn't have a very, very strong uh, uh, stance that is, is a huge controversy, uh, a, a, a contribution to another field. So Jordan Peterson, as a social commentator in the field of psychology, okay, can be a great luminary. You can say that, you know, to Jordan Peterson, the, uh, you know, the, the on those uh, fields, I take off my hat. <laughs> when yeah. it comes to biblical scholarship, I put it back on. Sure. I mean, yeah. that's fair. That, you know? that, yeah. I was about to say that that's basically where I am with him. Like. Because he he is a he is a PhD in um, social psychology, mm -hmm. so so I trust his opinion on things involving that. But when it comes to did Sodom and Gomorrah really get nuked, I wouldn't. I don't think I would go to Jordan Peterson. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, well, again, well, people spend well, time. If you're again mm -hmm. coming from the outside world, as I was, and uh, Jerry, can I just ask you how old you are? I am currently twenty three. That is a yeah. beautiful age. 
And, uh, and all I can tell you is that, you know, back in my early t uh, 20s and, uh, you know, late teens, it was all about hating, uh, 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 you know, your own theory, distrusting, you know, questioning your own paradigms. Skepticism. And never falling, sorry, not hating your own theory. I'm very late at night. You don't hate your own theory. It's, yeah. uh, I could say, not falling in love with your own theory. And uh, mm -hmm. I love the philosophy of Elon Musk, and maybe we can, you know, agree on that, is that is we're all wrong. Just start there. Just, you know, just accept it <laughs> that it's you know it's all about being a little bit less wrong hopefully that's true tomorrow. you know if everyone thought they're right we wouldn't have been here with all this technology and everything that's right i mean it's it's like it's like it's like i it's like i always say we're all idiots it's amazing we're all here too right but oh. what's what's powerful is that yes you know you have to uh be nuanced you know as a scholar there's definitely exaggeration going on as we said at the beginning of the talk you know there's uh there are there are there are special numbers and patterns that are being used there's uh symmetry that's going on because again the purpose of the bible the purpose of the of the torah okay is not um to be a historical documentary you know History as a science, you know, in and of its, you know, for its own sake, that was not a value for the Hebrews. The, the Torah is teaching. It's essentially a guidebook, you know, to the people of Israel of laws and these epic, epic classical stories that, that would help us to understand where we come from, the fault, our faulty beginnings, okay, and these mm -hmm. epic uh moral uh stories you know that we are to uh internalize for our for the good of our of our lives and our society so it, and it just happens to be however that the core narrative okay in other words the core events have a very very strong basis in historical truth the way that they're being conveyed is of course a function of um, the way you would tell a story like that, okay, to a late Bronze Age people, okay. to an early Iron Age people. You know, how would you convey such a truth? How would you convey such a saga? And what are, what are its purposes? Is it just this nerdy, you know, uh, nitty gritty, you know, detailed, uh, 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 yeah, uh, story? Uh, 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 purpose, I, 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 you know, um, is it for the, the nerdy purposes of history for its own sake? Or is it, like I said, to teach about the relationship between man and God and these, you know, principles of universalism and so much more? This this kind of leads me to like we're almost uh, out of time, but I want to leave like the. I was last just few about minutes. to ask you, and like, what's the clock? <laughs> right. It, we're You're almost the only out of time, but it. I just want to leave. Um, uh, an important question we had yesterday. We uh, yesterday we kind of ran out of articles uh, on the OPP Global. Um, yeah. And we left. We were left with kind of uh, some philosophy. You know, we just said, "Hey, let's do some philosophy." Um, I don't want to, uh, you know, get too deep into philosophy, but I do have one question um, that I don't think five minutes or ten minutes or even an hour or or a day can give it justice. But if you had to give a few words on it, I would be happy. If someone came up and asked you, uh, came up to you and asked you, uh, who is God? How would you kind of like give him the best picture of like, in a few words, do you think? And I, I, I'm sorry to say in a few words, because, you know, you can't give this question yeah. as much justice as you mm -hmm. can. But Okay, but what... so I'll let, maybe I'll ask, let Jared start. <laughs> oh, I mean, we did this the other day, but... I'll just, I'll just repeat what I said the other day. For me, God is a character, a character and a caricature that humanity sort of imposes onto the world as a way to explain itself. And I view him to me, because I'm more agnostic, is he's a tool for me to use, basically to prop myself up emotionally, you know, in times of distress. Like most humans, I turn inwards towards tradition you know, towards my heritage it, as a way to comfort myself. And I do that. The only times I ever really pray 
are when I'm, you know, like not doing very well. So for me, that is what God is. I view character, caricature, a way for humans to explain a very scary and unknown world. And as a way to basically deal with the pressures in their own lives. Okay. So um, I would uh, be able to say it in four ways. Okay. Uh, I say I give it four words divided into two parts. Okay. I have a, um, a spiritual answer. Okay. According to based on our tradition and more of a scientific approach. So mm. the one word, okay, from our, our traditions is amen. Amen. Okay. So why amen? So uh, es essentially, it says el melech ne'eman. So el meaning the creator, the creator of all. But more than just a creator who began the universe, okay, uh, and according to extraordinary uh, properties that we're not able to understand. For example, the perfect absolute balance between matter and antimatter like perfect exact balance and that should like be impossible the universe without the other yeah mm -hmm. no what it is is they should absolutely neutralize one another and there shouldn't be a universe according to physics at least as as we understand it today the universe should not exist okay the perfect balance between the strong nu nuclear force the weak nuclear force right? There's several different ways that the universe as we see it today just and again you can say it's teleological but there's an anthropic principle that you could you could see in it. It seems as though, from a human perspective, as arrogant as that may seem, as if it were created for us. Okay, there's this anthropic principle where we are even in, uh, where we're actually positioned in the galaxy, um, how our Earth is with our Moon. Okay, El, the Creator, but not just one who just let it, you know, uh, set it up going and ran away, but Melech. He's a king to us, Mashgiach, that, you know, whatever happens to us, and there are so many, uh, the more we learn about the universe, we're basically this hail of bullets. There are so many uh, uh, asteroids that could be hitting us at any particular time. The, the, the bullets that we have dodged that could have set civilization back, you know, um, that somehow we've missed, you know, throughout this process of creation, whether you look at it through the eyes of the of, the, of Genesis or or the, the Earth sciences, it's unbelievable that we have survived to the point where we are. And for most of that period of time, we were just at the Stone Age. So there's point. a Melech, there's a king who's watching over us. Okay. It's almost perfect, but some people would argue it's not perfect, but you can still say maybe it's perfectly imperfect. <laughs> you took the words out of yeah. my mouth. <laughs> perfectly imperfect. And, so. and, and the third word, I'm getting there, ne'eman, which is loyal. And we can see, for example, the, 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 the promises, you know, in the Torah, you know, through prophecies that Hashem would, you know, ingather us from the nations. And it is something so, so, so far be, uh, uh, beyond just the people saying, oh, it's written in our book that we will return, so let's return. There were so many, you know, attempts that failed and, uh, you know, genocides of, of, you know, both the Jewish people, Samaritans, Israelites, everywhere. And just the, the you know, the, this, these times of redemption are something incredible. So th those are... You know, traditionally, from my place of faith, you know, from our traditions, El Melech Neman, he's the creator, he's the king, and he's, our, and he's our savior. On the scientific perspective, okay, I would say he, he would be most closely, partially definable as the consciousness of the universe itself. So, for exact, example, Dr. Jeremy England, okay, they call, the, some are calling him the next Charles Darwin. And he basically gave the scientific community uh, basically what they what was the, the holy grail that they were looking for, which is the advent of life from simple chemistry, you know, a model by how that could happen how naturally, so to become, speak. 
Like, but he stole the fire from the atheists and actually said, you know, how dare anybody, you know, spin what I'm saying to go feed atheism because consciousness is found at every quantum point of this universe. So um, essentially, um, there, there is so much going for this idea. Wait, we better, you know, we have to be ending now and not starting a whole new talk yeah. that um, <laughs> the essence of the universe really is consciousness. And, you know, one little tiny thing supporting this is this is huge. A lot of people say you can't prove God. Well, there's something very, very powerful. It's called the multiple discovery phenomenon. And that is that at certain points in history, okay, we see a number of peoples or uh, a number of scientists or thinkers who not only don't know one another, they're, they don't even know of each of one another's existence. And the fact that maybe are working in completely different sides of the globe. Like for example, Char Charles Darwin and Charles Wallace, Indonesia, as opposed to like the Galapagos, discovering, you know, the mechanism of creation, evolution at the same time, you know, through natural selection. And that's just one of like a number of these, the discovery of oxygen, the discovery of calculus, the discovery. So essentially you have, it's almost as if, uh, and, and, you know, just imagine, for example, if, if the bomb, the atomic bomb, Imagine if this were discovered at, uh, you know, 500 years earlier, you know, in the time when England was still dragging criminals, okay, by their tongues through the streets. In other words, the discovery of atomic energy, it almost happens at precisely the point in time when even though imperfect, it's like civilization had come to a particular point where we would be able to, however imperfectly, try to control ourselves. Something that would have been utterly impossible hundreds of years ago. So um, also there's more evidence coming out um, yeah, by uh, Sir, uh, Sir Roger uh, uh, Penrose, okay, uh, Dr. Stuart Hameroff. They're finding more and more evidence of the brain as not being merely the producer of intelligence, okay, but more as a processor, okay, of information from without. Wow. So okay. again, we're you know I, I'm I'm done because <laughs> that would be my scientific approach. In other words, uh, you know you can't define God uh, um, uh, scientifically, but I would say the closest thing would be. The consciousness of the universe okay uh, um, and you know uh, spiritually from our tradition and we're just looking at history through torah eyes um, el melech ne'eman our creator our king our savior i think that was a beautiful answer really uh yeah. thank you for that and um Thank you so much for coming to our podcast. I have a feeling it's not going to be the last time for sure. We have yeah. so much to talk about. We, uh, I really also want to learn more about the history of my people uh, as Samaritans because I don't think I know a lot. And I, and you, I think you know much more than me about our history because, uh, <laughs> I mean, I think there is definitely lack of, uh, you know, information about us. And also these philosophical questions, we really like to dig deep, deep into them. So, uh, and it's easy to go into, like, uh, how do you say... Uh, kind of trippy territory. Uh, sure. So, yeah. thank well, you for. Was, for oh, I mean, philosophy is inherently trippy. It was a really, it was, is an honor, and um, I, I loved it, and I really enjoyed Jared as well. And I just see in here <laughs> really awesome. something very beautiful. Yeah. You know. We Damn have, right, I'm amazing. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of you know, we have someone who's you know uh, more of a secular mind, you know, more, and you know, somebody who's maybe coming from more from. A, the religious Jewish uh, uh, background perspective. We have a Samaritan. It's it's a, nice uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful balance, and I'm sure that you know maybe in future podcasts we'll have you know other uh, uh, yeah d different 100%. minds you know uh, bringing yeah. more synergy and more uh, you know more flow uh, between different mindsets, and that's just what it's all about. It's all about it communication and. Yeah. Uh, and just learning. I really love learning. It makes me feel great. So, I, and today I've learned. So, 
thank you for that. And uh, and, and by the way, Jared, do you know that yeah. um, Michael is a like a huge fan of our tahini? Really, he loves to. No. Oh, is it? Is is this how you're getting it in? Is yeah. This how you're it in? Ask him, please. Ask him. Don't you like it? Unreal. It's the best. <laughs> Every <laughs> damn. Thank you so much for our sponsor and uh, episode. <laughs> we have this nice theme where we have to mention tahini uh, at the end yeah. of the episode, and I have to kind of bring it in a smart way so that I think today you helped me do that. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you so much again for uh, for coming in, and uh, we're really looking forward for our next one. Uh, and thanks for everyone for watching. We. Uh, Really enjoyed this one. Thank you so much. Uh, don't forget to leave a like, leave a sub if you haven't already. Uh, share it with your friends and uh, uh, tune in for more. Uh, I think yeah. our next. Do you have an episode tomorrow, Jared? Um, I believe we do. Tune in yeah, like yeah, we yeah, we should be filming tomorrow afternoon, Friday time. Um, I can't remember with who, but I am very tired. It is one o'clock in the morning, people here in Israel. Right. We went right. we went pretty late with this one. Oh, and also Abigail. Um, is your scholarly work available online so sure. we can have it in the description for people to Actually, see and read it themselves? It's, it's, it's under my name. In fact, if we have a little chat here, I can... Um, okay. Is there uh, a chat? Yeah, there is. And I'm just going to get it to you in the next quickest um, half minute. There we go. Yeah. You can imagine it's a, a link... I've watched yeah, also one of your workshops on Torah and science. It was really amazing. Yeah, thank so you so much. I recommend All right. It. Okay, uh, here we go. All right. Uh, Abud, it is your job. You put that in the description. I will post that yeah. in the description. And uh, I'll give you another link also. And um, this is called TorahDefense.org. This is uh, something else you can also put up. Thank okay. you so much for that. All right. All right. Copy it. All right, this is it for tonight, everyone. Thank you so much, Jared. If you want to go and uh, finish the episode. Oh, I will. I will. I just got to get ready. Um, <laughs> oh, great bro. meeting you, Jared. And um, Abud, you're, uh, you're awesome. Are we are we offline? Uh, no, no, at, no, no, not yet. We're not, we're not off. Normally, so just... normally, he has this magic clap that ends the episode out of nowhere. Yeah. Okay, just... Nice. Yeah, because basically the canon of the show is I am a demigod who can smack all of us out of existence until we next record. <laughs> like this! <laughs> <laughs>